Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Franklin Roush of the Lander University Department of History uh, podcast. We have a history major with us today, Sydney Shepard, who is uh, being part of our kind of uh, uh, new program we're hoping to host on our podcast where we feature a student. I was thinking of calling it the student's corner, but uh, maybe the students can come up with something more catchy. So uh, hi, Sydney. Hi. Hi. So you're a major in, at, of history at Lander. Uh, can you tell us, why did you become interested in history? Um, well, originally I wasn't a history major. I changed my major my sophomore year and I was a pre-vet major and I was miserable and <laughs> I needed a change and I always saw history as a hobby. I never saw it as a career until I started taking just lower level history classes and decided that's what I wanted to do. Oh, excellent. And, and as a decide, my dad was a veterinarian. Okay. Uh, so uh, he, I've always dreamed of, of doing like veterinary history, but I've never been able to actually do it. But mm -hmm. it would be kind of an interesting part of the uh, history of science. Mm -hmm. it, it, I know you're on the you're on the equestrian team, right? Yes. Is that somehow connected that interest? Um, that's what brought me to Lander mainly. Is mm -hmm. I I never even heard of Lander before I came here, and I saw the equestrian center, and I was like, this is where I want to go. Oh, excellent. And I wanted to be at a uh, equine vet. And, okay. Um, but I still relate history to horses. <laughs> right, right. No, that makes sense. Well, I mean, you could do, um, I don't know if there's anything, there's actually a book that someone wrote about the history of dogs in Japan. Hmm. And so, you know, you could do that kind of history. It'd be fascinating um, to look at, you know, and especially I think what's interesting with uh, with like a, something like a horse, what's, the, I think there's kind of a transition between horses as just domestic animals that do work to friends in mm -hmm. a sense right like it, you, you get this developed deep bond that can exist Definitely. Um, so it's interesting how people you know make that that kind of movement um, but have you ever tried to pursue that or is it, what, what kind of history do you usually like to focus on um, for me it's textile history and fashion history okay um, I love creating historical dresses as accurately as I can um, that kind of started in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no formal sewing training. I'm all self-taught. And I made my first dress my junior year. It's an 1870s bustle dress. And I made it for my high school's history fair project. Oh, cool. And that kind of, st that's what really first started me off really loving history. And I just always make projects every year. Oh, that's really cool. I mean, how did you get the skills to do that? That's not easy, especially a bustle. Um, I originally, I saw a dress online that was only $500. And oh I asked my. <laughs> asked my mom if I could have it, and she said no. Sure. So I was like, well, I'm going to make it. And I just got on YouTube and watched YouTube videos and <laughs> oh, got cool. books and just taught myself. And wow. I learned from my mistakes. Looking back at that dress now, it's terrible looking because I've learned so much since then. Right, right. Well, I, that's still, I, I don't even think I could start, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, that's just astounding that you're able even to just mm -hmm. start doing it, that. It was really hard. That first dress took me, I don't know, probably six months to make. Wow. And now I could make a dress in a week or two. That's astounding, right? So, mm -hmm. so and I mean, what, what about the 1870s dress drew your attention? Like, I mean, that's very different from what we have now. So why mm -hmm. would someone in the 21st century want to dress like someone from the 1870s? I liked it because the shape was very different. Mm -hmm. The, um it's all kind of drawn to the back and those dresses have a lot of embellishments on them. There's a lot right. of lace, there's a lot of ribbon and ruffles on them. And I really liked how pretty they looked and mm -hmm. the kind of silhouette that they gave. Right, right. Okay. So it just, I, I, should, I have to point this out as an aside because you said that was in 1870s, right? Mm -hmm. In 1873, we talked about that today in world history, the Japanese sent this mission to the United States and Britain and um, they were really confused because, you know, women wearing bustle dresses can't tie their shoes. Mm -hmm. Right, you can't lean over. You have to put so your men, shoe on first. Right. Well, yeah, right, right. And sometimes they became untied, and then like their husband or their, their their you know their brother would have to tie their shoe for them. And Japanese thought that the men were bowing to the women and were like horrified at this you know <laughs> this this topsy turvy gender relations. So it was this kind of funny uh, sort of experience I thought, but that, mm -hmm. that's what just came to my mind. So um, do you still make stuff from the eighteen seventies, or do you other periods as well? Um, I haven't made anything from the eighteen seventies recently. No. Um, my goal is to have a dress from every decade. Oh, wow. Which is a big uh, goal to have. It's like but... 15 from the 1870s, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so I've made a uh, about 1770s uh, French court era dress. Wow. 
Um, that that was probably my biggest project I've ever done. That's a lot. Um, and I took it to some competitions in Atlanta and um, got to show it off, which was really nice to do. Um, I made a eighteen or sorry nineteen forties uh, suit and a nineteen forties dress. I right. made a eighteen twenties ish dress, which is very simple. That one. My goal for that project was to use all natural materials. So I okay. used natural cotton. The buttons are made of wood. So wow. everything was hand sewn completely. I didn't use a machine at all on that one. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's impressive. That takes some. How do you, I mean, how do you, what do you do when you're sewing? Do you like listen to podcasts or do you just, is that the time to think or to zone out? Um, sometimes I, I listen to a lot of my books um, for school. So I'll listen to my books or kind of study a little bit, go through some um, note cards, oh, and um, sometimes I do listen to podcasts. There's a lot of um, podcasts on fashion history that I like. Actually, maybe, uh, I mean, this is a chance you can plug your favorite ones, and you can forward them this podcast and say, oh, I plugged you. Mm-hmm. So what, what, what are your favorites? Um, there's one that's called Why We Wear This, um, and they do a really wide range, um, just kind of why, why do men wear suits and tuxedos? Why do... Uh, women wear hats that, you know, only a few decades ago, but don't wear hats now. Right. Kind of answering those questions that we never really thought of. That always, I remember in, uh, I went to, vi- I'm from Indiana, right? And I remember visiting the, the church at Notre Dame, the, the, the college, the university, and there's a sign outside the church. I don't know if it's still there. I think it probably is because it was like bolted into the wall and it says, gentlemen, please remove your hats. Mm-hmm. Right, gentlemen, right? Because men should take off their hats in church, but women should cover their mm-hmm. hair. In church, and that, that's mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, my when my grandmother was my age, she wouldn't be caught leaving the house without wearing a hat. Right, but right. now it almost looks weird if I were to wear a hat. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's the uh, what is it? The um, there was an Onion article about that in our dumb century. Is like man ventures out hatless, and it's, mm-hmm. it shows this one guy without a hat, and there's all this fear that he's going to die because <laughs> he went outside without protecting his head properly. Um, so, what has been your favorite one to make? Hmm. Um. I think probably I made the undergarments to okay. my um, 1770s dress. It was my first corset I ever made. Oh my! And it's hard. <laughs> it, it was very challenging, but also very satisfying because I had to make all these very very tiny channels to put the boning in. Okay. To make it stiff, and I really I had to learn. I had to make so many mock-ups of it to get the shape right and. And doing that project, I learned the importance of making the undergarments. Right. That if I just made that the pretty dress that everyone sees, it's not going to look right because mm-hmm. you have to put that on a certain silhouette right. that's built by the undergarments, and those change with uh, each, each decade. I see. Mm-hmm. So it's a total, yeah, it's a total thing, right? Mm-hmm. You've got this. Yeah, you this has to, it's not going to look right. You can't leave out certain parts of it, and so when I want to create a new project, it's not just creating the dress. I have to think about type of corset, the type of chemise she has to wear, the petticoat she has to wear. Right. They go underneath it to give it the shape that's iconic to that decade. And so what do you do with these once you you have them? I mean... Um, I have they, an right. old chest that I okay. put them in. Um, I like to wear them to conventions. Um, like Dragon Con was the big one I went to last year right. in Atlanta. And... Um, this summer, there's the Jane Austen Festival in Kentucky, excellent, which is Regency era dresses. Which I've never been to that one. I've always wanted to go um, out in California. There's Costume College, right. which is about a, um, I want to say it's like a weekish long convention for my kind of sewing for all these customers to come wow. out and take classes and to show off their creations. Excellent. Now, now here's the thing I'm kind of curious about because you could be into this without being into history, right? You could just mm-hmm. be like, I like this stuff. What's the kind of interactions then you have with people who, at those conventions, you're a history major, you know about history. Does that change how you interact with these people or how you, you perform the costumes or anything like that? Um, a lot of people that do this without being involved in history, they like to make them kind of matched up with something modern. Okay. Um, like at the convention I went to, there was a girl in a, a similar dress to mine, the eighteen or 1770s dress, but she did it matched up with My Little Pony. So That's she, interesting. <laughs> so it's like this really cool combination um, that you you don't really see a whole lot at, outside of these conventions, right? And um, it's kind of neat to compare someone that's has a historical background and someone that doesn't how the dress looks differently or how they look similar. 
okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so they, they, they feel in a sense, you know, you've, you've got two kind of different goals. They're thinking, mm -hmm. how can I update this? And you're thinking, how can I represent the past? Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent, excellent. So what do you then do at the conventions, right? I mean, people have, I mean, you, you you must do things other than look at just look at dresses. Right? Mm -hmm. um, for Dragon Con, that one it was all different types of. There's anime, there's um, TV show characters. Um, the co the historical costume is a small part of it. Okay. Um, I did a fashion show in my um, 1920s dress. Okay. And that was really fun. I've never done a fashion show before, so I got to wear it and like walk on stage, which was really oh, awesome. cool. And then I was in two different uh, competitions okay. for my costumes. Um, that was where, the, also that 18, um, or 1920s dress and my 1770s dress were also in those okay. competitions. And, wow. Um, it's really cool because I follow a lot of these people on social media that I was right. competing against. So wow. I finally got to meet all these people. Oh, that's cool. Um, and I, I've learned so much from them just through social media and then to finally meet and kind of see their costumes in person was amazing. Right. Well, that's cool. So how do you think, how does that then, to kind of reverse the question, how does this impact what you're doing in the classroom? Um, for me, when, especially when I'm studying, I, I remember dates by what's being worn. Okay. So when, well, <laughs> so when like in class today we were talking about the 1870s i'm like okay that's what these people would be wearing and that's how i can kind of remember right. things and i feel like clothing impacts history a lot more right. than we think oh yeah um, and i kind of think about i wonder when because some things were invented like the sewing machine was invented mm -hmm. on the 1840s i'm like how did this impact this part of history the industrial revolution like that changed everything right I think recently there's been a couple of books written on the impact of sewing machines on Japanese and Chinese history. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned that today, right, in world history class mm -hmm. about how you can tell, you know, that the Japanese are serious about reforming because they're wearing suits and ties. You can mm -hmm. tell what side Sun Yat-sen is on because he's wearing a suit and tie, mm -hmm. right? And I was trying to emphasize, this looks traditional to us, but it was radical mm -hmm. to them. So I think that's a that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can see the, the dominance of the Western suit, right? Mm -hmm. When there's a meeting, doesn't matter where people are from, pretty much, they're going to wear that mm -hmm. kind of clothing that's really interesting so i mean have you ever been able to like write a paper about this or like do a presentation on it um, i did the academic symposium about two oh, years ago i remember i couldn't go to that one i was very disappointed because i heard it was really cool and i compared um the transition between these large marie antoinette era dresses to these very simple regency era dresses and like right. what happened to go from such grand expensive dresses to very simple almost just plain cotton nothing on them dresses right like, well, there had to have been something mm -hmm. to change the past 400 years of clothing history right and i kind of found that a lot of it was the kind of enlightenment era that there was right. a change oh okay um especially with the french revolution coming up that was right. a, the french revolution had a lot to do with it that they wanted to abandon this kind of aristocracy image of those big dresses and they wanted something very very simple right what, what, I mean, for, the, hopefully, by hope, you know, so the, uh, you're, you're straight history, right? You're not the secondary school mm -hmm. certification, but there will hopefully be some history majors who are teachers. Mm -hmm. Professors will hopefully listen to this podcast. I certainly am hoping to learn something. What are ways that we can maybe integrate the history of clothing into history classes to make it more interesting? Um, I would say that there, I mean, historical fashion is its own little genre that you can, if you're teaching about Marie Antoinette, that the reason, part of the reason she got overthrown was because she was so extravagant and looking right. at her dresses, how extravagant they were. And um, there's this one really famous dress, I can't remember the name of it, but it's embroidered with all these motifs of um, different fruits and right. nuts and vegetables and stuff on it. And the person that owned that dress, her father was a merchant. Okay, and yeah. kind of you could use that to teach about the rise of merchants and how, you know, coming to the new world, we had all these new uh, vegetables and mm -hmm. new items that were put on her dress. Excellent. And that's the kind of thing, you know, we'll see this next week in world history class. I'll bring some World War One stuff to show students. Mm -hmm. But it's, I wonder, you know, is there like an, I mean, this, I don't think you do this with complete dress, but is there an item that we could get and pass around to students that you think would be particularly interesting? or that would tell them um, something? 
during World War One, definitely um, women had to be economic about what they wore. Right. And um, even in World War Two, especially women had to get rid of their nylon stockings. Right. Okay. Yeah, um, makes sense. And yeah. parachutes, even, right? Even and back then, stockings had a seam that went along the back. Right. Of right. It, yep. And women would draw a fake seam so yep. it looked like they like were they wearing stockings. stockings. <laughs> um, and I know nurses were, I feel like, a really big deal during World War One, and the the uniform of nurses kind of changed to be more nun-like, which I think was very interesting. That's interesting, yeah. Um, they even they started call that's when they started calling their fellow nurses sister, and oh, um, okay. they almost looked like they're wearing um, the hoods that nuns wear, and I think that I haven't really researched it that wow. much. But I think that's a yeah, really interesting thing you could look at. Right. No, that's really interesting. Okay, so that's so we're seeing some of those those intersections, and I wonder, especially in gen ed classes, like you know, the class you're in with me now. I mean, you know, some of the people are really into history, some people are just not. I wonder if that's an area. Mm-hmm. Um, but if the Tolkien video didn't get them today, nothing will get them. Yeah, and even um, just with war, the uniforms that the men were wearing. Mm-hmm. Um, I know some of the World War One uniforms are based off of Boy Scout uniforms. Right. Okay, um, I didn't know that. Which I think I don't. I'm not the expert in Boy Scout history. That Me, JD, JD here. yeah. Yep. Um, but I think how uniforms progress, and that's like the first war that, you know, we have machine guns. That's when cavalry units start to fall apart. Right. That we can kind of look at how did modern war affect the uniform. Right. I actually will talk about that. <laughs> I don't know if you looked ahead at the powerpoints, but I've got some <laughs> Napoleonic soldiers in a powerpoint. Then I'm going to pass around my. Um, I don't think I can. I don't know, I'll have to find it. I have a World War One helmet okay. that I will pass around, the German one, and uh, it's just like it's it's made of steel, mm-hmm. right? You know, and it's this very different thing from the Napoleonic style. So okay, mm-hmm. so that makes sense. So there's some things we can apply. So I'm curious, what what kind of plans do you have after college? Um, right now I'm going to be taking a gap year. I'm going to the University of Cambridge over oh, the excellent. summer for a international program. Cool. Um, I'd really like to study abroad for mm-hmm. grad school. Um, I want to get into preservation. Um, so all the costumes that I make, I want to preserve the original ones. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, well, how would you go about doing that? Like, what's the? Um, is there like a master's in preservation? Or mm-hmm, there is. Um, I would get a master's in preservation or um, in public history. Excellent. That kind of. Um, well, I wish we could have got you in the public history class. I know. That I really wish fun. I could have taken it. Um, and I guess the goal is to. There's different types of preservation, but making something last long past my lifetime that right. I want my children's children to be able to see this object right, and right. how am I going to go about making that available to them? Well, I, one question if I could ask, because going with this idea of public history, so I mean, right, it makes sense you want to preserve the original so you can keep it, but people didn't wear clothing or, or didn't have clothing to have hanging in their closets. It, it was designed to be, you know, not only to, especially like you, you were talking about like the merchant dress example, it's designed to be seen by other people. Mm-hmm. So how would you continue, how would you put it in its historical context while preserving it? Um, well, when you, there's a, a preservationist that I follow on Instagram. He works at the um, Victorian Albert Museum in London. Oh, okay. And Excellent. when he gets a dress, he has to make the mannequin for that dress to go on. That he has, because it has to preserve the shape of the dress. And, right. And um, he has to put it in a way that that dress would have been worn at the time. That if he were to, you know mold it to a modern dress it would destroy right what the, that historicalness of the silhouette of the dress right right mm-hmm. makes sense i'm just saying like yeah if you if you want to display a dress by marie Antoinette, right you like reconstruct a court scene right or something mm-hmm. like that to emphasize its importance in history mm-hmm. uh, one thing you've mentioned several times um is this important or if, uh is social media mm-hmm. and uh networking so i think that's that's one thing i you know Especially students will sometimes ask me, you know, what what kind of career can I get in history? And they're very nervous. And I, I give them, you know, the kind of standard answer about you're getting these skills that will help in a lot of different careers. You know, you, you really need to go out and kind of see what you're good at, right? What you're comfortable mm-hmm. with, what you're interested in. And you can apply those skills. So I think it's, a lot of the initiative has to be on students, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I think that's so key to finding a job is learning both networking skills and building up the network. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if you could give us some tips about how you were, because it sounds like you're doing it very successfully. Mm-hmm. How, do, how do you do that? How do you be good at it? Um, well, like this past summer, I had an internship slash volunteering at 96 Historic Site, and right. that's part of the National Park Service. So 
I had an amazing experience there and I met a lot of people that taught me so much about how just the park system works and how to kind of go about teaching history to the visitors and um, you know that built a connection with the park service so you know I could Mm -hmm. go on after graduation and apply for a job at the park service and having that on my resume really helps and um, even just the people that I don't know just over social media Mm -hmm. media that um, I've messaged them about internships um, and advice when they were in school like what kind of um, internships do you have what Mm -hmm. would you recommend you know if I want to do what you do what what short, sort of major do I need to have? What do right. I need to prepare myself for? And they've been very helpful in reaching out to me and helping me along with that. Excellent, excellent. So, um, right, yeah, it's, I mean, people say it's not what you know, it's who you know, and they say it critically, but I think that is important because it's important, you know, people won't hire you unless they know you're a reliable person, unless they know mm-hmm. you really know your stuff. And, and is this someone I want to be around, <laughs> right? I mean, that's a basic question. Um, so what, uh, what what are some mistakes people make when they're on this kind of volunteering or when they're on social media? Like, what are some pitfalls that they should avoid? Um, I mean, I'm you know, you don't need to state the obvious ones about, you know, don't. Yeah. But um, what, what, what are some things, especially in history? Um, like I said that, you know, I want to do what you do. Don't say that exactly because that means <laughs> you're taking that person's job eventually. That right. could come off the wrong way. Um, but kind of be more, I guess show that you have a genuine passion for history, right. that this is not just a job that's going to pay my bills, that this is something mm-hmm. you want to do and you're you're excited to go to work. Right, right. Well, how do you like kind of, because um, this is kind of, and this is me maybe just being a, an old Asianist that I, 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 but like how do you show gratitude to these people when they help you? Like what do you do? Um, well, my grandmother always taught me to write a thank you letter. Excellent. Um, right. So... You know, if I have an interview somewhere, even if I don't get the job, I send a thank you letter. Very good. Right. Um, wow. And, you know, I might not get that job now, but, you know, in a year or two, I might apply again and right. they remember me because I sent a thank you right, letter. Right, right. And just little things like that. I know we live in the South, so manners are very important to sure. us. Um, so that might be some of my influence in doing that. Um, but also just having a good looking resume that, right. you know, don't make it look like you wrote it in middle school. <laughs> right, right. We have a career center that can mm-hmm. help with that. But yeah. Um, and make it stand out because they're probably looking at hundreds of resumes. Right, that yeah. You, you want it to stand out visually and also with its content. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, I think bringing on a resume is very important. And then when you go to an interview, like, look professional. Like, right. Especially if I'm going into fashion history, I want to look yeah, you have to fashionable, be... <laughs> but also professional. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, I'm, I'm, and I, I don't mean to harp on that. I just, I'm just always curious what I'll have people ask me for help and never say thank you. And it's like, okay, see how, how quickly I answer the next email. And I'm not trying to be mm-hmm. a jerk, but it's kind of like, you want to make it psychologically easier for people to want to help you. And mm-hmm. people are busy and I'm, you know, that stuff goes in the back burner, but you're right. I think if you, that, um, that that's a good, and that's just a good habit to be in. So I'm glad mm-hmm. to hear you're, you're doing that. I think that's very good advice. Um, so we're getting to about what I would, you know, like I said, this is an experiment. I think we're getting to the, to a good kind of, you, I think the best podcast is usually 20, 30 minutes long. Mm-hmm. Is there anything though you want to say? Like anything that you want to share? This is your opportunity. It could be about fashion history, history, anything at all. Um, I think if I was speaking to freshmen, Sydney, when I was okay. miserable. Excellent. Oh, that, oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that it, it's okay to change your major. That, um, don't do what you think is going to make the most money or that's going to please your parents. Cause that was my big thing is I wanted to be a vet my entire life that that's what I always want to be. So that's what I have to go to school for. Right. Right. And then I realized that I wasn't happy doing that and to, to do what makes you happy that if, if it's something that's not going to make money, that's okay. That you know, you can make money, you know, doing history. You just got to work really hard doing it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and, exactly. You know, change your major is okay. I think freshmen should, take a lot of gen ed class and figure out what they like before they kind of make that commitment because it luckily that didn't put me off my four-year track but you know for some people it could I had to really work hard to keep that four years and to because I lost my scholarships because my freshman year so I really had to work really hard and get those back and I think that a lot of freshmen are in the same boat when they realize that this is not what I want to do the rest of my life right 
What I, I like that you emphasize diligence. I think that's the big thing is that sometimes I get the sense when people say, well, what kind of career is there for me? It's like, well, in a sense, you have to make that. Like, mm -hmm. it's not, it, it, even people who, you know, even if you're like a nursing major, that it's like directly, I'm going to be a nurse, right? Is it, mm -hmm. you know, they still have to work hard. They still have to find the, the mm -hmm. right fit for them. They have to figure out what kind of nurse and so forth. And it's the same thing here. We can't just sit back and expect someone to just throw a job mm -hmm. at us. We have to figure out both our passion, but then work hard to follow mm -hmm. that passion. I'm, I'm glad you emphasize that. And I'm, I'm looking forward. I hope that, you know, my hope is later we can have a future podcast with you while you're in graduate school mm -hmm. and then another when you are a successful preservationist. Yeah. Right? That will be the fun thing. We can have a nice, mm -hmm. it'll be a trilogy. Yeah, that'll be nice. If we will. And then, uh, unfortunately, we can't have any prequels because that's not how history works. Yeah. But, but, uh, but you did kind of allude to that with the talking to freshmen, Sydney. Mm -hmm. well, so, well, thank you very much, Sydney. Uh, I appreciate having you on here. I hope your listener, oh, I'm sorry, I do remember uh, one thing I was going to mention. Is, is there just any, we kind of mentioned that. If someone's interested in what you're doing, if someone's like, this is really cool. What Sydney's doing is awesome. I want to get started in this kind of uh, in in making historical dresses. Where should that person start? Um, if you have no sewing experience, go to YouTube. That's <laughs> that is where I learned. Um, and I thought I was alone in this world, and then right. I got on social media and realized that there's so many people that do this for a living. Right. And I think that's the coolest thing ever. So get on social media, talk to them. We're such a kind community that we really like to reach out and help new people to the community. Um, so I definitely, I encourage them to do that. There's a lot of channels on YouTube um, and on social media. Um, there's Hop and Bobbin on Instagram. She's amazing. The stuff she sews is just wonderful. Um, Burnett Boehner, I think is her name. She's on YouTube and on Instagram and the stuff she does is amazing. She comes from a a theater background and then she started making historical garments and it's kind of interesting to see how those worlds collide excellent oh that's really cool all right well there there's the real ending there so <laughs> thank you very much sydney and i hope our listeners enjoyed